beginning, in the early 80s, Fairfax area, Melrose area, like that was where everything was popping. You literally were bumping shoulders. It was so deep down there. I'm seeing all this stuff and I'm just getting hit. It was just really a cool spot for us to hang out and we chill in these alleys right here on rooftops, just mobbing all day, just bombing the neighborhood. It was the center of where a lot of these people found themselves and created who they were gonna be. A very special place. It was things that were edgy and new. Artistically, like there was stuff popping up. Renee's skate shop was right there. Like there was Nana's. You go in there and get your docks. From 1984 through 1998, Melrose was in its heyday. Graffiti, tattoo shops, music. It was wild and it was our neighborhood. Melrose, man, it's amazing. I just noticed there was this emphasis on Melrose. It was like this beat up street. And I was still a junior high at this point, but I was ditching school to go down there and hang out, get some donuts, you know, get a soda pop. I didn't even get into smoking weed or drinking beer yet. I was just like, wow, this is really cool. It was this disenfranchised little ghetto mentality that LA was developing and it really became cool on Melrose. It was just like an evolutionary type thing. I went from being the kid that got in trouble in school for doodling on my desk or drawing and then I started skating and then the next thing you know I'm doing graffiti. The rawness of skateboarding transferred into graffiti. There was no right way to do it, wrong way to do it. It was just a form of expression. You're just like sailing with this new found identity, this new group of friends, this new energy. That's what was interesting about graffiti to me is you could be no one and suddenly you're important. You were somebody. Melrose Avenue stretches from Silver Lake all the way to Beverly Hills. The area that we took over was La Brea to La Cienega and mainly La Brea to Fairfax. That square, that was our neighborhood. We managed it, we developed it. We were the caretakers there. When another crew would come in and tag it up, we'd go rock pieces over their junk and make it look nice again. This is my living room right here. And this is where I grew up since I was a little kid. I know everybody on this block on both sides, in and out of the stores, walking down the street, driving down the street, and sleeping in the alleys. Just got into graffiti for the excitement. We're running all day, jumping fences, and I got addicted to that. The alleyway is like this area that business owners and people don't care about. They're like, screw it. You can, you can go to the bathroom back there. You can throw your trash back there. There's an old couch, busted bottles, and there's potholes, and dirt, and straight alleyway cats. We took the alleyway and was like, we can't hang out on the street and do this. Let's go hang out in the alleyway and do this. And no one's going to give us any trouble. You could even like tag, and some old lady would walk by and just be like, huh. Keep walking, you know? Whereas if you're on the street, someone be like, hey, you know, what are you doing? Cut that out. So it was a safety zone for us to experiment and explore the possibilities of what we could do. We'd be hanging out on the corner of Melrose and Fairfax. We'd be there broad daylight or we'd be there at night hanging out, waving the cops. They knew what we were doing and they also knew we were the guys that were, I guess, in a sense, beautifying the neighborhood. Right now we're on Melrose and Kirsten. And this is one of the walls on Melrose that we maintain and constantly paint. This wall was just a series of the walls here that have been tagged and just kind of left abandoned. A lot of the owners just get stuck with repainting them over and over and over again. So we ask them, hey, you know, let us paint a mural here and we'll maintain it. We'll try to keep the wall nice in case it gets tagged. A lot of the times when we do this, the walls get more respect. It's turned out to have, you know, longevity over the 20 years that we've been here. So we just try to put some art on these walls that are messed up and bring a little life to the neighborhood. Back in the day, it was a little more raw. You know, there was no artwork down here. There was nothing going on. And this was a central meeting point for all of us. And we'd come down here and all hook up and mob. Eventually, we just started catching a couple spots, painting rooftops and stuff like that. All the places that we would paint, after we would paint it, we would kind of lock that spot down. I think we were one of the first crews to establish a neighborhood and you know it didn't happen by accident. We had to battle gang members and other riders and the police and the punk rockers and the bums and everybody else down here. We had it on lock. We were walking like 25, 30 deep walking down the street all the time. It was a different adventure every single day. Before you know it, we went from being total underdogs to being the guys, the ones that were pushing the envelope. It provided a safety zone for other people to be like, damn, you know, I want to go hang out with them, man. They're really fighting for their right to do art. And I think that was a huge, huge influence to every other graffiti writer in the city because 
they didn't think of it that way. You know, they didn't have an area that they said, this is our street. This is the age of pioneering for this art form. My crew inspired a lot of people to come down there and indulge and bask in this great scene that we created. Store owners started noticing our artwork and Mirror was one of the first I remember and getting commissioned to do storefronts. For example, Yanata. Mir was commissioned to paint that shop. He was the first one to paint it. That was crazy back then, to see some dude up on a ladder. And no one had ever seen anything like that. And we were out there, while it was getting painted, other store owners were walking up to us, asking us, hey, could you paint my store? And from there, it just kind of blew up. It's kind of an acceptance that that existed. Our vision was, let's take over this street, and after we're done with this street, let's take over every other street after it. And that's what Melrose provided for us. I remember one afternoon, me and my boy Skate and a couple other members, we were down there painting in the alleyway, and this little hot rod pulls up, this little crazy long-haired Russian dude in it, and he's like, hey, I like that, you know, I really like that. I'm opening a record store. Yeah, I'd like to get some of your art in there. And I was like, cool, and came over, checked his store out. I think I painted a room for him. He's like, this is incredible. You did that in two days. Like, paint this wall now. So I did that and this next wall, and then the next wall. And then suddenly it was the whole store I painted, and then he opened up, and it was this huge deal. And I guess all these other stores wanted that cool too. All of the people that were buying the stores down there were feeling the same energy, and they were allowing that energy to coexist. You had creative people working with creative people. And there was nothing better in LA than that at the time. Yonata was a kickoff point for a lot of that stuff. I think that the fact that he painted that store made it possible for other people to get commissioned to other spots. That led to another spot in another alley and just spread like wildfire. Before you knew it, you couldn't cruise down the alleys and not see tons of art. Here were people that were allowing us to be there. It became like a free-for-all at one point. It was nuts. It got so crazy that at a point in the mid-90s, Melrose was so popular for graffiti, we had Japanese tourist buses coming down to La Brea and Melrose and just like a mob of people. They would just jump out the bus and just start photographing us. And I watched all these other graffiti writers from all over LA start hoarding down to Melrose. That was an amazing part of our thing, you know, somehow we legitimized this criminal activity to get the murals done. These are the alleys and the streets that really we cut our teeth in. Melrose was a very important place. It was a mecca for creative energy for the area. Maybe you would see Slash from Guns N' Roses come out the bar right at the corner and then turn the corner and see Mir bomb an entire two-story full production across the whole wall and they'd be 15 feet from each other. And that was just raw creative energy happening right here. You had open walls, you had open turntables. You know, when you talk about the birth of dilated peoples, we definitely sparked dilated peoples right here on Melrose. To see that happen, and see the growth of the fine arts movement and graffiti arts movement happening, it kind of turned this into a haven. People from all over the world would come here to paint, to meet writers, to trade sketchbooks. It was a great time for a lot of people, and a lot of those people ended up doing a lot of big things. You would meet people from like Munich, or Australia, or England. They'd be, oh yeah, I heard there was graffiti in these alleys. And you're sitting there talking, oh, how'd you hear that? Oh, my cousin came here last summer just to see the alleys, just to see our stuff. That was our little gallery. The heydays of Melrose is kind of like an entity. It showed up, it sat down, it hung out, and it's moved on now. There's no control over it. Business owners do not get to control it. The homeless people on the street do not control it. The shopping committee does not control it. We all magnetize to wherever it shows up. People find, oh, I'm not being inundated here. I'm not being suppressed and strangled. We found something raw right here. There's actually diamonds in this coal. That's what happened on Melrose. I'm a child of that. It spawned me. And all my friends in this whole scene of Los Angeles graffiti art has been birthed and spawned a great deal from Melrose. I started backing out of it and start looking into the art galleries and uh, trying to evolve myself as an artist because I realized then like, oh, I'm seeing the, the fruits of all, everything we've developed and this is what it becomes. And so I think me and my crew, we decided to grow from that point, getting out and around the whole world now and showing the world what we developed. We had several galleries down off the Melrose Street that were super inspiring. The number one gallery was Zero One. That's the first place I got my show at. That's the wall I painted my friend Skate One who passed away on. That's the alleyway where a lot of my great murals took place at. The Choice, 
to go from the street and enter the Zero One Gallery and do my first show there with Chaz Bajorquez was really an important decision in my life. When I made it into Zero One, I realized that this is a privilege and I'm very lucky to have reached this status and it's a responsibility to uphold this now. And I think that inspired a lot of my friends. They're like, damn, you know, he did it. I want to do it too. You, know, you really got to own your decisions when you don't have a plan B. You're really responsible for every move you make. John Pockner from Zero One on a gallery and nurtured some of us and brought us in. He was just a wild man, you know what I mean? He just did it. Cause like, oh yeah, man, that's cool. Yeah, put a painting right there. We'll try to sell it. And, and here we are today. Now that's what I do. I'd be walking down Melrose and there'd be all kinds of murals there. And so I'd see stuff that I liked and I'd put it into the gallery. These graffiti artists that I showed were just incredibly talented. It was really the same as seeing any talented artist anywhere. So all they had to do was get some canvas, you know, and instead of painting this with the same equipment and the same paints on a wall somewhere, they could do that same idea on canvas. I've seen a lot of progression in graffiti come into galleries over time. There was never even a thought of really having graffiti art into a gallery, but now it's all kind of fused together. And I think it's a good thing because people are recognizing that we're artists. I'm on canvas now and working on some exhibitions and constantly trying to push myself to be a better painter. If you're not evolving, you're dying. And it's a constant evolutionary thing. My palette has always got something on it. My easel always has something on it. I'm constantly experimenting and just trying to keep it fresh and keep it raw. And most importantly, most importantly, I think with anything really, but especially in art, you have to have fun. You just want to do something in the realm of time travel. We used to paint back here all the time, like when we were kids, and 2013, we are. It's like almost 30 years later. This all goes back to a bunch of us hanging out in these alleys and just having a good time, doing it for fun.